seminars. The title of this seminar is Business as the Social Engine of America, Enhancing the Employment Success of Young Adults with Significant Disabilities Through Supported and Customized Employment. I'm now gonna turn it over to Dr. Phil Rumroll, the HDI Director of Research and Training. Dr. Rumroll. Good afternoon. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Bauer, for, uh, uh, for the housekeeping and for all uh, you did to uh, put together this first of our spring seminars. I want to add my welcome to all of you and uh, it is my honor and privilege to be able to introduce our speaker, Dr. Paul Wayman. Dr. Wayman is a rehabilitation psychologist by training, and he has been a faculty member in special education and physical medicine and rehabilitation at Virginia Commonwealth University, VCU, in Richmond for uh, more than 40 years. Paul, I think you started when you were about nine years old, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Paul also directs the Rehabilitation Research and Training Center uh, at VCU and has, uh, has been in that role for, for many, many years as well. Um, Paul is well known to uh, anyone who works in inclusion-related fields uh, for his pioneering work in supported employment and transition, customized employment services and supports for people with a variety of disabilities, such as autism spectrum, spectrum disorder, intellectual and developmental disabilities, traumatic brain injuries, and many, many more. <clears throat> and many of our audience members have, have uh, read some of, of Paul's more than 250 uh, professional journal articles his 50 commercially published books. <clears throat> and with all of those, he is certainly well known nationally and internationally as one of the most respected and uh, prolific authors and researchers in our business. Paul, I could go on and on and on, but I won't. I will tell you that uh, if you had any doubt, if people are paying attention to the work you do, I think there's a strong testament to that and that we have about 1,250 folks registered for this program this afternoon. It's the afternoon here on Eastern Time Zone anyway. And uh, I think that says it all, Paul. And with that, I will yield the microphone to you with our sincere thanks and gratitude to you for providing this lecture to us. The floor is yours, sir, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil and Walt, uh, both, both of you. And I want to give a special Shout out to Kathy Shepard Jones and Phil and Walt and, and also to uh, Jennifer McDonough, who's been, it was very helpful with a lot of her thoughts on uh, some of the business aspects of this presentation. Um, really, really, really excited to be doing this uh, you know, in conjunction with the Human Development Institute, the University of Kentucky. Um, and a lot of the things that, um, that we're gonna be covering um, have been heavily in my mind because I continue to be frustrated as many of you are, I know, with why it is that we continue to have tens of thousands of people with disabilities um, either underemployed or unemployed um, or frankly just not even getting an opportunity to really get in the door. Um, especially since it's 2021, notwithstanding the horrific 2020 and the pandemic, um, the reality is that we know so much more. So um, a good part of this presentation, is, and really the title kind of says it all, um, is going to be focusing on things from the perspective of business and taking having us who are probably predominantly providers um, talking about the role of business. And um, I just want to say a word or two about this at the beginning before we start rolling. And there are a lot of slides and there's videos and things like that. Um, and there will be time at the end for uh, a number of questions. Um, uh, a, copy of the entire 
um, PowerPoint will be available right at the very end of the presentation, okay? Um, but not right now, unfortunately, but at the end of the presentation. Um, but, it, you know, it, it, it's become really clear, I think, to, well, I know this is true with many voc rehab state agencies um, and with some of the more progressive community rehab programs, but then there's a lot of people who are new coming into the field that just may not realize that if we don't partner with business and understand business, that we are not gonna hit the targets that we want to do. So, um, and that's where my slides are gonna be going for a good 30, 40 minutes or so. And then we'll, we'll, pick, we'll pick up, you know, areas off of it a little bit further. But, um, and, and yes, the webinar is two hours, but I'll probably talk for, you know, probably a, probably a good 90 minutes. We'll see how long I can last, okay? Okay, Walt, so Walt's gonna move these, these, um, these slides for me. And if, if you go ahead, Walt, that would be great. And you're gonna also thumbnail me too, I think, Walt, but if you would do this first slide, it would be good. All right, so I, I just picked out a, a, few, um, a few of the slides that um, are, you know, are in Kentucky, uh, uh, big companies like Kindred and Humana and FedEx, IBM's in there, yum. Okay, go ahead. So, um, and, and again, Walt, um, like I was saying to you before, if it's possible that you can put my picture smaller in the corner somewhere in, as we go through this would be better because it is overlapping somewhat the, um, you know, the, the slide, okay. Um, so if, if there's a theme to our presentation, it is what are the human and social challenges of this unemployment? And I also want to talk about underemployment, okay? And, and what are the best ways to bring people with disabilities into the workplace? So, we, so next slide. So if we look at, um, you know, in, in this next slide, um, we're talking about business, which is the, the demand side. These, this is the group that needs to have good workers, all right? And so let's just take a second for that. No business is going to grow and expand their revenue base and create the type of culture they need for customers and market share without good employees. That is a critical feature. Any business person will tell you they need to generate revenue and they have to have really good business people. And um, as a person who works at Virginia Commonwealth University um, and for you know many years, I've had the privilege of, of running a rehabilitation research and training center. We have about a hundred staff and anywhere from 10 to $12 million a year of federal or state money. But those with those staff comes the responsibility of having the right staff, people who understand how to uh, um, um, uh, reach out to people in the community, communicate well with the community. And so when you look at, when you look at the demand side, you're looking at, um, you know, un unemployed persons with the supply side and business with the demand side. So as we, as we go through this, particularly this first part, I'm going to be approaching this from the way business will look. So, um, on this, this next slide should, should be what we'll be covering. There we go. Um, we, we continue to have a high percentage of people with disabilities unemployed, 60 to 70%, or we wouldn't be even doing it today. Um, businesses, businesses ironically report, they continue to report 
they have a hard time finding programs where these people with disabilities are. And they, yet they do have needs which can be filled by workers with disabilities. I've had some very, gr really great conversations with a number of people in the business world. And what they tell me is that um, individuals with, um, with disabilities, um, individuals who may be coming from other countries, immigrants, um, uh, older people who, who've retired and want to come back. Th these are other populations that they have to look toward in order to fulfill some of the needs that they have to generate revenue. Remember, generating revenue and profit and also having a, go a good community footprint um, is critical. And, and that means good people. Okay, next slide. But unfortunately, Certainly businesses still do have lots of fears and there are myths and concerns that are out there um, regarding people with disabilities, okay? And of course, you know, those, uh, those of you who are in voc rehab and I understand that um, I have a number of um, favored colleagues from Virginia uh, VR that may be on. So shout outs to people like Dee Dee Batten and Donna Vanessi and Richard Kreiner and Kathy Hayfield and and uh, also many of the counselors that we work with over the years and a partnership. Um, and a lot of this, you know, is going to be just reinforcing what they know. But frankly, businesses don't understand, um, you know, what an individual work program is, okay? Uh, they won't understand necessarily what CRC is or IEP is or PRIAS means. And so the, this language to them is sort of like us listening to KPIs. You know, how many of you out there know what a KPI is? Well, a KPI is a key performance ind indicator and it's a critical metric that businesses use to make decisions. And I was actually speaking with a company in Virginia not all that long ago who have identified um, diversity inclusion as a critical KPI for senior management. And I thought to myself, oh man, that is fantastic. All right, that's becoming an important KPI. But that's language that they don't teach when you're getting your master's degree in rehab counseling. Okay, next slide. So, there are misperceptions about people with disabilities in the workplace. And for some of you who are like me and who have been doing this work for a long time, um, or you know, if you've got a DJ Hendrix who's on here from you know, the Job Accommodation Network, this is old news. But for people who are newer, um, you know, or who are very new or family members or advocates, these are some of the misperceptions that are out there. I mean, you know, we're, we, there are still feelings that, you know, boy, it's going to cost so much extra time or, or to call in sick more to have people with disabilities there. And they're not, they're not going to get the work done on time. Not, 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 not. That's not true. In fact, you know, again, you know, if you, you look at like, hospital and they'll, they'll tell you that they're that the interns in with autism are showing up on snow a lot of the other employees are unable to show up because they love work life and they won't be there so that is not a correct um you know perception that is a misperception but then unfortunately does then cause either supervisors or interviewers from business maybe to not have the best feeling. Okay, so next one. So what's the research show? Research does show that we need more accurate and practical information to dispel those preconceptions and concerns about hiring people with disabilities. So how do we really do that? Well, we can, we can have talks like this and I don't want to put myself down, but the reality is these are just talks. 
or we can actually try and help as many individuals with disabilities become immersed in different companies, different industries as possible with severe disabilities, mild disabilities, uh, mobility disabilities, sensory disabilities, phys uh, physical disabilities, cognitive disabilities. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, okay? But the more they're immersed in the workforce and they're doing well, employers begin to have different viewpoints. Research shows that employers want credible information that includes facts and statistics to dispel those myths. And again, I would argue that working with people is an excellent way to overcome a lot of those myths and, 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 and misconceptions, uh, concerns, fears, whatever. That's why I am a huge fan of uh, internships like Strength on Success or the Bridges Program or Project Search. Um, there's a reason that internships um, have been so popular and that's because it's a wonderful way for business which is the demand side and people with disabilities in their families which is the supply side to get to know each other. Okay so the next slide. So you know businesses frequently severely performed Again, here we are again with the healthcare costs, work, work, workers' compensation problems, cost of hiring, and the belief that people lack skills. And, and, and here's a really big one that we've learned in our research the last several years. One of our research. Forming business one, that supervisor may be uncertain about how to take disciplinary action. And that's why a good rehab counselor or a good employment specialist or employment consultant can make all the difference in the world. All the difference in the world. Okay. Because that supervisor, in a sense, could be getting um, modeling, uh, you know, kind of a, a go to consultation about what should we do but I don't want to fire them but you know they're not really cutting it or their social behaviors or the soft skills aren't really good um, but it's going to look bad if I fire them because I know the boss my boss really wants to keep them here so you know that is a legitimate challenge okay some of these other ones I think people find out pretty quickly the health care health care costs they don't skyrocket okay and some of these cost issues are not what people think. But there is a genuine challenge often if a supervisor has never worked with somebody, for example, who, who, who either speaks very unclearly or can't speak. How, how do I communicate best with them? So just, you know, dropping people into jobs. Again, that's the supply side, and that's our responsibility to team, okay? But the reason I'm starting with business, folks, is because more than ever, I am, more than ever, I realize that both on the pre-service side and the in-service side are not shown employment specialists, our teachers, our transition specialists, our counselors, um, uh, let's see, I've got a great question here. Um, we may want me to turn off my video. Um, let's see, I wouldn't mind having my video off. I can, should I turn my video off? What's perfect. How about that? Maybe that's better, okay. Um, so let's see, I don't want to lose that train of thought there. So, um, staying with business, staying with business and understanding the culture of business will empower us to help individuals with disabilities. Okay. All right. Next slide.
So continuing, let's take a, a quick last look here at some research. Oh, uh, 14%, that's about one out of seven companies report they're actively recruiting people with disabilities. I'm gonna go with that research and say that I'm not really very happy with that. That's one out of seven. That's not really gonna cut it, all right? And I think that reinforces some of the earlier issues. Uh, HR doesn't know who to contact. We haven't created the pipelines that we need to. And we'll talk some more about how to deal with that. Larger companies are more accurately to recruit and smaller companies, a third. But then again, smaller companies, which we'll say are less than 50 or 100, that's only one out of 12, 8%. And those are companies that really need and want to grow. Some of the largest companies, they don't need to grow. They, need, they may go into different lines or segments. They may take over different companies and, and, and have to add people. So it may be that you know, there's always gonna be some more positions with larger companies, but in terms of the percentage relative to the revenue base, the smaller companies, in order for them to generate their, their base, their revenue base and make it larger and then re replicate their companies in different parts of the state or the region, they're going to need employees. And if only they're only going for 8% of people with disabilities, they are missing out. And then service producing industries are more likely to recruit. We've, we've found that than those in goods producing industries. Now, you know, I'm not sure I know the reason for that, but that's one I'll leave for, you know, for the uh, significant number of people on this to think about it. Are we, are we only pushing people towards service jobs? Are there just more service jobs out there or are there goods producing jobs, but we're, we're just not in that, you know, we're not in that world as much. Something to think about. Okay, next slide. So what do employers think about the impact of persons with disabilities? And um, before we switch to the next um, um, uh, slide, um, we, we ran uh, through one of our research and training centers, which is related to um, successful employment practices. We ran a, a um, state of the science employer panel. <clears throat> we had a, a large, a number of employer, employer panels and we don't have enough time in this presentation to, to, to cover all that, but um, we've got about five and a half minutes of a video that Walt's gonna put up that I think will be helpful. And um, it will give you an idea of what a couple of employers from different industries thought about, okay? And Alyssa uh, Brooke is gonna go ahead and narrate it. So um, uh, go ahead, Walt. So I'm gonna go back around to um, Jim. Now we've talked about, you know, your your experiences, but I want to know when you were first, first approached and started thinking about this, did you have any reservations about hiring people with disabilities? And if so, how were those resolved or maybe not resolved? Yeah, I think, um, you know, to be honest, I've had some of the normal um, reservations that anybody would, particularly, you know, given that this was a number of years ago, when we weren't quite as open to these things as we are today. But the advantage that, um, that I had is I had leaders who um, either because a family member was disabled or they had some other experience in their past or just the fact that we're in healthcare. So we're accustomed to working with people um, with a wide variety of disabilities. So the leaders would approach me and say, you know, I want to do this in my department. Um, I um, want to employ um, people through the Salvation Army who are struggling with addiction. I want to work with um, the Department of Rehabilitative Services to hire people with Down syndrome. And so that's, that's how we got started. So um, I didn't have to encounter any resistance. Um, and uh, to the point some of the other speakers made, we had some fairly high ranking executives who had um, personal interest in being an employer that was open to uh, employing people with disabilities. 
And the final point around that I'll, I'll make is um, On Score Mercy Health has, you know, been around for, you know, a couple hundred years and, um, you know, we are um, sponsored by the Roman Catholic Church. So, you know, part of what we are about in our mission is, um, you know, is helping people and uh, accepting people and those types of religious principles that permeate our, um, our the reason that we exist. So, um, that coupled with being in healthcare, I think, made it relatively easy for us to, to proceed with this work. Yeah, and I, I think that some uh, organizations talk about their mission, but as was mentioned in the presentation this morning, and I've been walking around in scrubs in Bon Secours hospitals for like 11 years now, you really feel it. You know, they're not just talking about this as their mission, but you really do get to experience that. Um, Doug and David, can you guys also talk about this, this uh, question about your reservations? Yeah, it was, it was interesting from my standpoint, I didn't have any reservations. Uh, so my role was really to uh, alleviate the res reservations of the team. And when we kicked this off, um, I recognized that the only way that it was gonna work was if the entire organization was, was involved from day one. Um, that included um, a union workforce of over 300 employees. So I brought everybody into a, a, a big lunch room <clears throat> and we had over 300 people, you know, standing in the room. And uh, the first question I asked, and if you recognize that one in 54 children is on the spectrum, is that it impacts so many families. And so the first question I asked, I said, raise your hand if you know a, a, a family member who's autistic um, or a neighbor's uh, a, a child who's autistic. And when you see in a room of 300 people, virtually every hand goes up, it expressed the size of the issue that uh, we are all dealing with. And so I think when all those hands went up, everybody in the room said, wow, this is a huge issue. How can we help? Um, so, so, you know, that, that's how I kicked it off. And then from that point, um, you know, David and his team worked very close with, with my, you know, senior executives and, and management team um, around, you know, here, what is autism? You, you know, you, you probably haven't uh, been around an autistic person. And, you know, most people hear all the horror, horror stories um, versus recognizing that the spectrum is very, very broad and then each one of these individuals um, brings something to the table um, that, that is truly valuable. Uh, the other piece that, and, and it was said earlier, and, and I say this all the time, when I did this, this was not about charity um, at all. Um, this wasn't about um, creating a situation just to give somebody a place to show up to. This was all about creating opportunity um, and how, having individuals feel a true self-worth. Um, and so when, when the organization truly found out that this was a financial uh, a benefit to us, here, you, you know, as an employer, when unemployment rates go down to, you know, two and 3%, um, you have an entire uh, potential population of employees out there waiting to be hired as an employer, I'm saying, all right, you know, how can, here, I need employees, how can I get them? And so, so you know, rallying the team around it was, was ultimately the call that made that happen. So I'm gonna go back around to, um, Okay, so Walt, I think that's it. All right, so um, the first gentleman, um, Mr. Jim uh, Godwin, uh, was for a number of years the uh, head of um, the uh, director of human resources for the state of uh, Virginia, Bon Secours, and is currently, I believe, the chief um, uh, and, uh, director of uh, strategic. Uh, resources for the overall company since Bon Secours Health System has merged with the Mercy Health System, making them like the fifth 
biggest in the country for faith-based hospitals uh, systems. And um, he's been just um, extraordinary to work with. And um, the second gentleman, Doug, at, uh, our, our colleagues from the University of Wisconsin got to know him uh, because he was a CEO at Hartshaft and Remarks and had, um, as he mentioned, strong family connections with, with uh, individuals with, with the disability. And um, when we get a little bit later and we talk a little bit about impression management and some things like that, I think that will make, that'll be a point. Um, I think the third bullet under research shows, and, and this was a lot of the things that came out of some of the, some of the material that, that, that we've learned from talking to business over not just the last four years, but really over the last 20 years, like you could really say. But the closer you can get to the C-suite, the closer you can provide intervention at a senior management level, the greater likelihood you have on focusing companies' policies, which will include disability, um, uh, inclusion, um, um, race, gender, all, all the types of things where companies are realizing more than ever, um, certainly after last summer, but even before then, that their company will get a leg up on other companies if they're more diverse. They will be able to recruit better people if they are more diverse. If they only have one type of person giving them ideas about how to market their product or service, they're not gonna be as powerful. If they only have one kind of person who, who customers see all the time, and yet those customers reflect the different faces of America to, to coin a Joe, a Joe Biden phrase, um, then they're gonna be at a disadvantage. So smart businesses of all sizes are increasingly opening their eyes to capable and qualified people with disabilities. And it's up to us to make sure that those people with disabilities get in front of business. And it's also up to us to provide the trainings and the support on an ongoing basis if necessary, so that business doesn't feel that they're just taking an unnecessary risk or do, doing something that is, you know, charity. When in fact, more and more managers, I can tell you this for sure because I've talked to them, they're telling me they want to hire people with disabilities because it will make their company stronger to be able to sell and to grow. And that's what business needs. They need, in order to sell, grow, and have a strong footprint in their, in their, in their city, in their county, in their region, or nationally. Um, I mean, it only takes two or three or four com you know, companies. Take Starbucks, for example. You know, they, they had a couple incidents. Well, those incidents that weren't good got a lot of news, right? You, you all remember some of those. And yet Starbucks is very, very progressive, extremely progressive. So, and they, you know, they're very sensitive, they're very sensitized to that. So th this is where the research is in 2020. We're way different than we were in 1980 or 1990. Okay, so the next slide, uh, our next video will be a little shorter, about four minutes. And it's again, going back to that panel that we were on that conference we were doing looking at the uh, impact of persons with disabilities on workplace culture, okay? Play it. Sure, I, I think, you know, from a business culture standpoint, and, and again, my company's a family company, um, and, and before we started the program, you know, how we operated was, was each team member was, was part of a family. But when I watched the managers who were, were truly responsible for um, developing the program and, and working with the individuals, the um, empathy, the um, uh, excitement, um, the feeling of accomplishment and contribution that the management team gained um, in the process was truly amazing. I think what it did is, is it um, uh, helped people even become closer 
as a family culture. Um, and then also, you know, one thing that I, I always express and is very important is, is, you know, we all have a role in our communities. And I think, you know, for the team, um, this program made them feel um, a bigger part of the community and how they could, could give back. So it, it had a tremendous effect uh, positively uh, on, on the entire organization. And, you know, the, the team members uh, were just spectacular to have with us. It's, yeah, I obviously piggyback on what Doug had said, but what, there was one specific story that I think is important to share. Um, the second individual hired at Doug's was in special orders and there was a job that uh, a series of tasks that this in that we found that was very repetitive in nature and uh, was just costing immense time for for the amount of team in the special orders department. So we plugged this individual with autism in there. She did it phenomenal and exceptional. And this was also an individual who was fired from three previous jobs up until what Doug had done. But what we found was that that, that team in special orders, because of her name was Maurice, because of what she was doing, they became more aware of what the other team members were doing because they really weren't, she wasn't I'm making up the names, but surely wasn't aware of what Sally or, or Jack was doing. So because now they had to be more of aware of what their responsibilities and what they had to check in with Maurice, they became more aware of everyone's role. So I think it, it improved even the business side of them being more productive as a team. Um, so that's just one thing to be aware of when, again, when those evidence-based strategies and practices and the education and the training is in place, um, it goes beyond that, that, I think that corporate culture, but what businesses want to see is higher product, many businesses want to see a better productivity and a, and a return on their investment. And, and you know, we, we're painting a picture of, of everything, you know, with peaches and cream. Um, you know, you will have people inside your organization who, um, you know, aren't fully on board. And, and I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, so the young lady that David was just talking about, uh, here, I don't think we have issued a physical check in my company for payroll in 10 years. Uh, you know, everything's direct deposit. And um, so what happened was, uh, Marie, she got her, her pay stub and it was direct deposit and she couldn't understand why she couldn't go cash the check and see the cash. And, you know, trying to explain to her, well, the money's already in your account. Um, she's like, no, it's not. So, so she, she physically needed to take a check to the bank, cash the check, see the cash, and then give it back to the teller to put into her bank account. And so, so the individual who was responsible for uh, uh, our payroll, is like, well, we can't do that. And I'm like, we can do anything. <laughs> go, I go, you know, we can either just go get petty cash and pay her, um, or, or, you know, we do have checks. I sign them every week that go to um, a variety of vendors, issue, issue a, a check and we'll sign it. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> so, Uh, the particular anecdote at the end by Doug, and I, I, I'm, I'm glad we were able to play that because it, it was such a simple thing. But again, he was a, he's a president, okay? <laughs> he's got the power and he's like, no, we're just gonna do this. It's not that big of a deal, all right? And I think the closer that our uh, upper management and top management get to the upper and top management of, you know, the, the companies that are in, you know, the respective states that you represent, the greater likelihood we have of those types of things happening. Um, I think what I have learned the most uh, in my career related to this and 
I continue to be just extremely, I get extremely excited when somebody gets a job that others didn't think they could get a job. And I, I still haven't lost my enthusiasm by any means, especially when I realize that, you know, when you, when you talk to either the Chamber of Commerce or Rotary Clubs or Societies for Human Resource Managers, well, that's one group. But when you start talking about churches and Little League baseball teams and, um, you know, women's garden clubs and, you know, lo local, local bands in, in a community. And you begin to realize that all those families have got either people with disabilities th that are growing up and want jobs or have got husbands who are in middle to upper to very upper management or know people who are. Like they, they sell product to them. And we're not using that. We're not using that network enough. Some of us are. But in order to really, really power it through, we need to use that network and not just try and use the, the, the tools that we might have learned in our university courses. Um, and, that, and that just that came out over and over again. And, and a lot of this common sense and you know, I know that there's a number of people on here. We've got a lot of people on here, and I'm so pleased and happy that, that people decided to, to, to come and listen on this Friday afternoon here. And you know, you know a lot of this, but then there may be people who don't know it enough, or we may know it on a, on a kind of pedant, you know, a, a pedantic or uh, educational level, but we're not really doing it. We're not executing it. So let's take a look at, uh, let's move to the next slide. So why should businesses hire people with disabilities? Okay, we've got, um, next slide. People with disabilities are great resources. Um, there should often be a balancing of commitment to hire people with disabilities with their metrics that they may have already whether it's healthcare or, you know, whatever the business is. Um, they are looking at maybe overcoming deficit perspectives and, 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 and overcoming this charitable impulse. And as, as opposed to how can I man maneuver the use of this person to maximize my revenue and my market share. And then understanding and supporting this whole concept of intersectionality in the workplace, which is a big fancy word for having different folks who talk different, look different, or what we think looks different. By 20, by 20 30, or 40, or 50, you know, a lot of us who are on here, you know, we, we may be the ones that are not in the, you know, we may be very much in the minority, okay? But just look around you. Things are changing all the time, okay? And I think just like business is beginning to understand they need to embrace climate change. They know they have to improve infrastructure. They are beginning to understand that they need more creativity and intersectionality in the workplace. Okay, 